So let's dig into Swift 2. A lot has changed since Swift was released, so we're gonna start from scratch for beginners to learn the basics of the language. So I'm gonna start off by opening up Xcode 7 and getting started with a new playground. I'm gonna name this uh, Swift 2 Basics. I'm, I'm gonna hit next, and I'm just gonna save that to my desktop. So here we're sitting in a playground in Xcode, and a playground is an easy way for you to just type code and see it evaluated in real time on the right hand side. Uh, I'm not going to start off with this, so we're going to start from a blank slate so we can see what this uh, tool is capable of. So right here we're writing Swift code, and I can just type an expression here like 1 plus 2, and it's going to evaluate on the right hand side. I can also assign that to a variable. You declare variables with a var keyword, and so I can say var x equals 1 plus 2. Now immediately you can see that this is different from Objective-C in that there's no semicolon here. Uh, we didn't declare the type at all for X. In fact, the type is inferred. So if I hold down the Option key and I click on X, you can see that it's X is inferred to be an integer because it's the result of integer addition here. Now X is a mutable variable. It's a it's truly a variable. So I can change its values to say something like X equals 10. And then you can see 10 on the right hand side. Uh, Swift also introduces first class uh, support for declaring variables that are immutable or that shouldn't be changed, uh, sometimes known as constants. So if I say let x equals 1 plus 2, uh, this is a constant value and x from that point on should never change. And so it's giving us an error here because we're trying to assign it to 10 and it's not going to let us do that. So this is a language feature that helps us enforce immutability where we want it. And uh, just from a compiler's perspective, immutable immutability is uh, preferable for performance reasons and other optimizations they can make, uh, but can also uh, avoid sort of um, other side effects like things that might be surprising to you in your code if, uh, if something was mutated uh, without you knowing it. So formalizing that is, is pretty nice. So we've got x, and x is inferred to be an integer, but if we didn't uh, give it a value initially, so say we have a var y and we want y to be an integer, but we don't have a value for it yet. So the way we would do that is by uh, specifying the type with a colon here, and then we could later on assign y to some integer value, and it's going to work. If I try to assign it to, say, false, this is not going to work because y is an int. So if I look at that, cannot assign the value of type bool to a value of type int. We also have uh, floats and doubles. So if I say var z, or rather, I'm going to use let z because I'm going to prefer immutability wherever possible. I'm only going to use var if I plan to mutate a variable. Uh, so I can say 5.5, and then this is going to be inferred to be a double. Uh, that's uh, If I want just a float, then I would have to specify it like that. Okay, so those are some basic types. Uh, we've got bools, ints, floats, and doubles. We also have strings, so I can say hello Swift, like that. The interesting thing about Swift strings is that there's no uh, at sign in front of it here, which is really nice, so they're natively supported. And they also support Unicode, so you can uh, you know, uh, open up your little Unicode window and you can you know, say hello policeman, and uh, that all works. Okay, so say we have a uh, something and we want to say hello and then put a name in there. So if we have the name as a variable called Ben and or called name with a value of Ben, then I can add two strings together like this and it will work. If I wanted to add in, let's say, a period to the end of the sentence, then I could use a plus with a period. And this is kind of getting pretty ugly. And this is where Swift string interpolation can really make things nice and neat. So instead of uh, appending strings like that, I'm going to interpolate a value inside the string. So the way you do that is with a backslash and a pair of parentheses. And inside the parentheses, we're going to put the name there. And so whatever's inside the parentheses is going to be stuffed into the string at that point. This is a really, really awesome feature. You use it every single day. So oftentimes during your program, you're going to want to print out strings to the console for debug reasons or just to understand the flow of something. Uh, so you can do that with a print. And so I can print something just like that. And that's going to go into the debug area. Uh, notice that it printed out the value as well as a new line character. If I open up this little debug panel here, uh, you can see that it says, hello, Ben, right there. And if I print another message after it, uh, then 
you'll see that those two things are separated by a new line because print is inserting that for us. Um, you can print, there's a, there's a couple of uh, variants of this function right here where we're using this one, but there's another one that takes a separator and a terminator, and uh, there's some others we can just ignore for now, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print out uh, the two things. We're going to print out the name and the message, and we're going to separate those by a pipe character, and then for our terminator, we're going to use, I don't know, three dollar signs. And when I do that, notice that it's printing out our value separated by a pipe and terminated by three dollar signs. And if I print something after that, notice that it's going to be on the same line because we didn't terminate with a new line character. So that's how this print function works. So that's pretty handy. It's a lot uh, improved from Swift 1. And OK, so now that we've got print out of the way, Let's talk about some more advanced types like arrays. So here I'm going to have an, a, an array of items. I'm just going to say one, two, and three. And again, just like these up here, the type here is inferred to be an array of ints because that's the type I gave it. And so here, notice the square brackets around the keyword int. That's going to denote a type of an array of ints. So that is specified like this. Even though I don't need to type this, I can if I want to for clarity. Uh, but if the compiler can infer it, usually I'll leave it off. So now we've got an immutable, because we're using let, we've got an immutable array of ints here. So I can't try to append onto it because uh, this is immutable. So this is going to force me to change this to var. And Xcode even gives us this little thing called a fix it. And I can fix it, change let to var to make it mutable. And it will update that for us. So now we've got an array with four elements in it. Uh, there is another way of specifying arrays, which I should go over. Sometimes you'll see it noted as array with uh, angle brackets here with the type inside the angle brackets. And this is the same exact way of doing it, just a different style. Uh, sometimes you'll see one, sometimes you'll see the other. Uh, this inside of the angle bracket is called a generic type constraint. So that is going to be uh, the type of every element in the list. So if I had a, uh, you know, a false and a true in here, then obviously that's not going to work. If I let it interpol or infer the type for me, let me get rid of those. If I let it infer the type for me, now it's an array of bools. So it works pretty much like you would expect. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this explicit type constraint or explicit type declaration there. And if we try to make, uh, say we have an array of mixed items. So I've got one false and A. Those are three different types. It doesn't really know what to do for that. And so if I try to look at it, it's like, it says error type. I don't really know what type this is. So this doesn't even compile. So I would have to tell it that this is an array of any. Now, any is basically, it's the top level. Anything can match this. Um, there's also any object, uh, which would work, except false is not an object. So that wouldn't work there. So we would have to use an array of any. Now, obviously, we prefer a typed array where the type is specific to the types that are in there. So you don't really see mixed arrays like this very often. And the reason is, is if I want to pull out items sub zero and pull that into a variable, let's use uh, A, if I look at the type of that, the type is an int. So then I can add it to other ints. So I can, you know, do math on it or whatever. But if I try to do that on the mixed array and I pull out item sub zero, then I'm going to get on any. And so in order for me to do anything useful on this, I'm going to have to cast it. And you cast with the as bang operator as int. And it better match, otherwise the program is going to crash. And this every time you see the bang operator, you should think this is a potential area for the program to crash. Uh, so if I change this to a string, guess what? It's not going to work. We got an error. And this is the type of error that would happen at runtime, not compile time. So this is particularly dangerous. Okay, so we're, go we're obviously going to prefer using typed arrays where possible. Okay, so um, also with immutable or rather mutable arrays like our items array here, uh, in addition to appending items, you can also um, remove items. You can remove at a given index. So I'm going to say remove an index zero, and then I'm going to insert a new element, uh, let's say, 10 at index zero. And then notice that we're just doing 
you know, array manipulation here. It's pretty obvious. And there's another thing that you might not be familiar with. It's called slicing. So we're going to create a slice of an array. That's basically taking a uh, range in between two values. So we're going to take our items array and we're going to uh, index it like this, similar to how we just pulled out the first item there. But we're going to provide a range. So I'm going to say, give me index one all the way up to and including index three. So notice that gives us what looks like a new array with those items in it. If I wanted to uh, up to and including three is the three dots. If I want to say up to but not including or up to but less than three, then you would use a less than character there. Interesting thing about this is if I hold down option and click on slice here, the type is not array, it's array slice. And the reason why this is interesting is because sl a slice acts like an array, except its indices are the same from the original array. So if I try to do slice zero, we're gonna get an error because there is no element at that index. If I try to do slice one, I'm gonna get the item from the original array at index one, which is this one. So that's something to keep aware of. This You can use this to your advantage. Uh, and this uh, changed in a recent version of Swift, so this is definitely something to be aware of when you're slicing arrays. And of course, you could just enumerate arrays uh, with standard for syntax. So I can say for item in items and a pair of curly braces, and then inside of there I can do whatever I want, like for instance, uh, I don't know, print out the item. I'm gonna say item, item, like that, using string interpolation. And notice that it tells me it happened four times here. And if I look in the debug area, we see our items. Now I can iterate over slices in exactly the same way. And then I get the slice from uh, you know my various items. And then uh, I can also, in addition to like enumerating over the values, sometimes it's advantageous to also get the index of that item. So you can do that on basically any collection that has this enumerate uh, method on it. If we take a look, actually, let me type that again. If we take a look at the documentation here, it returns a lazy sequence type containing pairs, n and x, where the n's are consecutive integers starting at zero, and x's are the elements of whatever that base array is. So if I type enumerate here, enumerate, now instead of getting item, I'm gonna be getting a pair. So I'm gonna uh, say that I'm gonna get the index and the item. So now when I print it out, we're still printing out the value, uh, but I could say item and then put in a interpolated value here, index. And now you can see the, the index of these arrays. Now, obviously this is the index in what looks like an array. So the first element ends up being zero. So this is actually a little bit misleading because it's not taking the index out of the slice. Uh, also something to keep in mind. Uh, but when doing it on an array, it acts just like you expect. You have zero through, you know, the last element in the array. And next let's look at dictionaries. So a dictionary is a mapping from one value to another. It uh, offers, uh, you know, different semantics on how to access values rather than accessing them by a position, you access them by value. So it's really good for lookup tables and that sort of thing. Uh, so say I want to have a dictionary that is a menu of items to prices. And so I'm going to say let menu. And again, I'm not going to specify the type. Um, actually, I will specify the type, and then we'll see how we can uh, remove it. There's two ways to do this. You can do uh, this style where I want a string for the key, and I want a float for the value. That's one way of specifying the dictionary type. And then the other way, which is the way I prefer, is just to do it like this, where you have a... a kind of like an array, but inside you have a colon, which separates the key and value type. Okay, and like I said before, this is actually gonna be inferred by whatever data we give it, as long as we give it a string and a float every time. Okay, so here we're gonna have uh, a menu for a Mexican restaurant, so we're gonna say queso is, I don't know, 450, and then we're gonna have some tacos, which are, you know, six, six dollars, let's say, and we'll have some enchiladas, which are eight ninety five, and some fajitas for, I don't know, $21. So now we've got our menu. Uh, it's a dictionary from string to double. So similar to what we specified, but it inferred double for these instead of floats, which is fine. And now we can 
um, grab things out of that menu rather than doing it by position like we would do with an array, we're going to do it by the key. And so if we want to find out how much queso is, we can ask it like this and get back uh, this value. If we want to make that a var, we can also say menu, let's say we have some chips and the chips are $1 or something. And so we would do that like this. And so now we've got chips in our array as well, or in our dictionary as well. To clear out a value, you can say menu chips equals nil. And that's a way to remove a value from a dictionary. So if we print out the menu again, notice that we see it over here. And I can actually click this plus button. It's going to put it right in line, which can be really useful there. OK, so that's the basics of a dictionary. If you want to iterate over a dictionary, uh, you can do so similar to what we did with an array. So we can say for uh, item and price. So we're going to be enumerating over both uh, items in the pair uh, in the menu. And then we can say uh, we're going to print uh, item costs price. And then we take a look, and it shows us those items here. One more cool thing that you can do with uh, Swift Playgrounds just while we're in here. Um, if, if I have a for loop and I say uh, 4x in, uh, let's say, we're going to do a range of uh, 0 up to and including 100, let's say. And here I want to uh, look at the value x. Rather than printing it, I'm just going to say look at the value of x. And if I um, add that value to my list, it actually shows me the value over time, which I think is amazing. So we can actually have uh, different things, like I can look and see what um, you know different math functions actually look like. See, we have a, a curve here. Say I could uh, say let range, or I'm going to say let max is 100. And here I'm going to go from 0 to the max. And then I'm going to grab a value inside of here, which is going to be whatever x is minus max divided by 2. So I, I can actually get negative numbers as well. And instead of looking at x's, I'm going to look at v's, which are the uh, negative version. Now we have our, uh, you know, what looks like a parabola. And this can be really advantageous for you to look at numbers over time or to see how values change over time. So that's a look at Swift 2 Basics and Xcode Playgrounds. We're going to dive in more deeply into the language in future episodes. So uh, keep an eye on nsgreencast.com, and thank you for watching.